All right, so we are still talking about live system analysis. So taking, uh, picking up where we got up to last week, where we're looking at a um, figuring out what we can from a computer that's already running and still running. And we were talking about, you know, what you can do when you see that you're being hacked and like looking at an IP address and finding out a little bit about who they are. Uh, and whether or not to try and contact them, and I was saying it's probably not not a great idea in most situations. Um, and um, you know what to do if you need to recover your system. Um, you might need to like change your passwords, keep you know update your software, make sure you've fixed whatever problem they were um, managed to get into your system in the first place. Um, keeping in mind that if the attacker might still have access to your system, it can be quite complicated because you know they might actually be watching the steps that you're taking on the computer. Um, so if you can see um, a process that is the attacker, then you might um, want to kill the process. So um, basically you can find their, um, find their processes, you can just do like PS minus X and see a list of all, all the processes and you might want to um, list it by user ID or something like that which you can do um, and you can just kill kill off processes so on a Unix system there are like signals that you can send to programs and there's a kill signal um, which is um, the command kill confusingly can send signals that don't kill it it can send any kind of signal but minus nine in Unix terms means like to actually terminate the process without waiting for it to respond so if you do like kill minus nine and then like a list of PIDs like process IDs then that'll kill those programs or you can also do kill all minus nine dash dash user and like a username so if for example some user account's been compromised you can literally just run that command and it will um, just kill off all the processes that that user is running at the moment. Um, and you know you might want to set up some firewall rules to stop that same IP address coming in, keeping in mind that they can easily change their IP address by you know if going through a proxy or VPN or something like that. Often, if you're in a VPN, just reconnect to the VPN and you get a new IP address. Um, so. There's a number of things we can do to actually investigate a suspicious process that's running. Um, we might want to use kill-stop to actually stop the process um, rather than kill it off um, completely. That way, for example, if we grab the contents of the RAM or you know, we can start or we could actually debug that program as it's running, we can actually find out stuff about that program. Um, whereas if we just kill the process, we might lose that information about what that process was doing beforehand. So the Linux kernel um, has a directory called proc, so slash proc. That directory is a pseudo, it's a pseudo file system. So it's not actually on the hard drive itself. So if you turn the computer off and you look at the hard drive, there is no slash proc directory. But if while, while or if there is, it's empty. But while the um, computer's running on a Unix system, if you type ls, you'll find that there's a directory sitting there called proc. And inside that directory is a whole bunch of directories and files that represent the state that the computer's in at this moment. So actually there will be um, a, in within proc, there's actually a directory for each process ID. So for example, there'll be slash proc and then a um, number so for every single process running on that computer, there's another directory sitting inside that directory that represents information about that program that's running. And within that directory, for each of these processes, there's a bunch of files. Again, they're not real files sitting on a hard drive, but they're files that you can access, and it's like talking. You act By accessing that file, you're talking to the kernel, and it gives you the contents of the file, which is actually dynamically created uh, it's kind of like how websites have changed from being static, where it used to be that a web server would just fe feed through a, an HTML file, to now we've got dynamic websites where it's generating stuff on the fly. It's like that where the proc file system is not sitting on a hard drive, it's just the kernel is creating these files as you ask for them. So you ask for, for example, a file called environ inside uh, one of those directories and it'll tell you what all the environment variables for that process is. So it's 
just a, a whole lot of information that you can find out about processes that are running. So you can actually see all the network connections for, it, for a specific process um, inside of the net directory. Um, and you can see what the command was that was used to start the, pro the process. You can see the namespace, so you can see like where which files that process can see. Uh, and we'll talk about chroot uh, next semester, so that'll make more sense. Um, and you can see the sim link to the binary that was actually used to start the program. And interestingly, um, say for example, um, say a program starts and then it deletes itself, that program may no longer be on disk, but if you look inside this proc directory, it will give you access to that program that is still um, even though it's been deleted from the computer, you can get an a get access to what the original program was. Um, so you can get at that via proc. So I know it seems a bit weird, but once you actually start looking at this stuff, it's going to make a lot of sense when you do it in the lab. So um, you can see um, where the program is stored. Um, and you can see in this, in this case where you do um, proc blah, 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 exe, it comes back and says that it's been deleted. Um, and um, in this case, it was because I'd up, Firefox had been updated since I started it. So it, did, it was no longer on disk, the version that I was running, that was currently running. Um, but you can, it does actually give you access to that program and you can um, compare them. So if you um, use SHA sum, which is integrity checker, you know, you can get the, the um, the SHA hash for a file. If you do it on that original file that you can get at from the proc file system and you do the same thing for the one that it's pointing at, you'll see they actually come back with two different hashes, meaning the version that's running currently is different to the version that's on disk. So that, that can be quite um, interesting because if you're trying to figure out you know what's happening, then that can help. So um, just a little bit of an aside, I guess, is the fact that Linux kernel is modular. And some people get confused by the fact that the kernel is modular and yet it's monolithic. So um, this is go kind of going back to operating system architecture stuff, right? So the Linux kernel is um, known as a monolithic kernel, which um, means that everything in the kernel runs in the same context, basically. Uh, so if you can get a device driver to run in the kernel, then you basically have full access to everything in the kernel. Um, which from a security point of view isn't great, but from a practical point of view is really good in terms of speed and all that sort of stuff. So uh, there was, a, I don't know, this is even more of a sidetrack. In um, was it the 90s, I guess, there was a big public debate between Linus Tavolds and um, Andrew Tenenbaum, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, who was a, um, it's like a computer scientist who did a lot to do with computer architecture and stuff about basically when when Linux was released, he said that's a load of rubbish because you should be using a modular uh, a, a micro kernel, not a monolithic kernel. And anyway, so the Linux kernel is monolithic, meaning everything runs in the same context. It is modular though, which means that you can dynamically load parts of the kernel as it's running, so you can load device drivers into the kernel. Um, so if you need a new network driver, for example, you can load that into the kernel. Uh, and those are known as uh, loadable kernel modules, LKM. Um, so, you know, if you lo try and mount a new type of file system, it can load the driver for that into the kernel and stuff like that. Um, unfortunately, it's also a security risk, right? Because if you can load a kernel into the module, uh, if you can lo load, sorry, if you can load a kernel module into the kernel itself, then you can basically take control of the kernel, which is obviously bad. So um, you can avoid that by making sure they never get root access, you know, ideally. Um, but also you can use other ways of stopping that from happening, which again we'll talk about next semester. So, um, and this is what I was just talking about, the, the kernel being monolithic. So um, you can see here that um, a monolithic kernel, you basically have applications, and then you have the kernel, which is basically all of this stuff. So all of the stuff the kernel does is all 
basically one thing in kernel mode. And you have micro kernels or hybrid kernels where there's more stuff that the operating system is doing that's outside of the kernel space, which is slightly better from secure, for a secure, it, security um, point of view. Apple use a hybrid kernel on the x86, unlike x64 platform? Um, I think technically Windows is also a hybrid kernel. Um, yeah. Um, and microkernel um, are things like herd, which, as we know, didn't really has never really taken off. But there's L4, uh, and so there are there are microkernels. You can use a microkernel to run the lin Linux on top of. So if you're really keen, you can use L4, which is a microkernel, and then you can have the Linux kernel loaded multiple times on top of that, so that you can have like secure separate versions of Linux running on the one computer, for example. Which is similar to virtualization, is that but what not. OS does? Don't know. Don't know. Um, so so yeah. Anyway, it's kind of an aside, and don't worry if you should, if you're not quite following everything I'm saying. I'm happy to clarify later if you're interested. So there's also another um, pseudo file system called Sys, and um, that includes information about the kernel, uh, including what kernel modules and hardware. Uh, is loaded. So um, you can actually write to it if you've got permission to to actually configure the kernel. So root can actually write into certain certain files in there and that'll actually change the kernel's behavior. So for example you could might be able to like um, enable security features like App Armor by writing to these uh, files. Uh, again these files aren't sitting on a hard drive anywhere they're like virtual files that the kernel is looking after. Um, you can type the command ls mod and it will list all the kernel modules that are loaded. If you've been hacked or if you think you might have been, that's a really good step to use because um, you know you, you might want to know about any kernel modules that have been loaded. Again though, it might be lying to you. So I hope you can see that common theme that I, of what I've been talking about the last couple, like last week and this week. You really need to take everything that you're seeing from the computer with a grain of salt. Um, because you might have a rootkit installed um, which might be hiding the presence of various tools, files and processes and things um, that, are, that are on that system. So um, it'll allow an attacker to actually maintain access and hide their presence on the system. And the Sony rootkit which I, I have I talked to you. Um, possibly. I know it was on Beastie Boys album back in the 90s. Um, so again, another aside is that um, Sony, the record label, um, and multi-corporate conglomerate or whatever, um, they, um, I think this is the 2000, early 2000s or could be late 90s, they, uh, all of the CDs are a bunch of CDs that were released included uh, rootkit basically. So when you put the CD into your computer, it automatically installed this software. And the purpose was to stop you from pirating like the music or whatever. So it's a digital rights management feature. But actually, what it, the way it worked was like a rootkit. So it would hide the presence of certain um, files, and it would if you go to you know if you press um, Control Shift Escape on a Windows system, you can see the processes. It wouldn't show the processes of um, you know the Sony rootkit basically. But also, as a malware author, you could hi all you had to do is rename your files a certain way, and Sony Rootkit would conveniently help you hide your presence on the computer system. Uh, and it caused an uproar at the moment, and I'm always outraged when I ask people how many whether they've heard of it because the answer is well, no at the moment. But it was like a big deal at the time. So um, user level rootkits. So there might be um, rootkit that's entirely in user space. So for example, if I went to the computer and um, I replaced all of the tools with a different version of the tools. So I replaced your PS command with my version of PS that just filtered out certain results. That would be all in user space, so the kernel wouldn't need to change in order for me to do that. Um, or maybe I would replace system libraries. So uh, you know, as we were talking about before, and I've talked about it in each of the labs this week, um, whenever you start a program up, on um, you know whatever operating system it loads often code will be loaded from shared libraries so on Windows we're talking about DLL files on, on Linux and Unix 
talking about shared object files. Um, so you might actually, PS might stay unmodified, but the libraries it relies on might be misbehaving. So that, that's another possibility. And again, that doesn't require any kernel level access. Just if you're a root user, you could just replace all those files. Um, a rootkit might actually inject code into a running process. So for example, you might have a program that's running and you can inject a DLL into that program that's running and therefore change the behavior of that program. Even though the program itself hasn't changed, none of the libraries it depends on has changed, but we've tampered with the process that was already running. And you know, you'll know, you will have seen that already last year in DSL when you were using meta, um, mature product payload, you can actually migrate the payload into different processes so that you can like migrate this bad behaving program into any process that's currently running on the system. That's quite scary, actually. Um, so yeah, so so it can you know that's that's another way of, for a rootkit to work. A more sophisticated rootkit might actually be changing the way the kernel works. So you know, remember every time a program needs to access something, it asks the kernel for permission, and the kernel does the heavy lifting. So a program might say, "Tell me what files are in this directory," and the kernel replies back with the answer. Um, so if you can change a kernel, you can change basically the way that everyone sees everything on the file system on 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 a computer. So if you um, maybe inject a device driver that's malicious or a kernel module into the kernel, you can actually influence the behavior of all the processes on the system. Um, and then your rootkit's basically running at the highest level of privilege in the operating system, which could actually make it hard to detect it as well because a virus scanner is just going to ask the kernel, can I please see the contents of this file, right? And then the, um, the kernel might say, yes, this is the program that's running. It might not be, right? So that can be quite tricky and um, different antivirus, anti-malware software tries to get around that, but it's still, it can be quite difficult for, for anti-malware to detect the kernel level compromise um, to the point where they might actually try and analyze the kernel itself, but you know, not, not easy a lot of the time. So a, on Linux, a kernel rootkit might alter the system call table. So um, does anyone here know what a system call is? Tell me, remind me what a system call is. So basically, it's just what exactly what I've been talking about. Where when a program asks the kernel for something, that's always via a system call. So a program says, "Open this file," and that's via a system call. The kernel says, "Okay, I've done that," and you know, then please tell me the contents of the file. Again, that's a, that's a system call. The kernel says, "Yeah, here's the response." You know, here's the result of that system call. So. If you alter the system call table, you can like point the kernel so that instead of calling the normal system call, it goes off and does something else instead, basically. Um, which is equivalent to direct kernel object modification on Windows, basically the same thing. Um, for 64-bit versions of Windows, all drivers need to be signed, um, which offers some protection. How reliably they, def you know, those signatures are um, vetted by Microsoft. I don't think it would be very hard for an attacker to get a, a um, certificate that would allow them to sign a driver, but it offers a small amount of protection. So, um, virtualized rootkit is basically the the sky is falling and give give up all hope of ever detecting the fact that you've been attacked is when they basically install the rootkit at an even higher level than the kernel which is where you basically put the entire existing operating system into a VM and then change the hardware layer so that you're basically intercepting messages to the hardware itself. And basically, if that ever happens, then we can just all give up all hope of ever detecting it. It's theoretically possible to detect that it's happened by looking at CPU usage and stuff like that, but it's just, yeah, really hard. So there are some academic examples where they've demonstrated that this is possible. There's a program called Blue Pill, and it basically does that. Yeah, and so it's been demonstrated. Matrix too many times. <laughs> yeah, Matrix um, reference. Didn't the Americans get caught doing something similar with um, mm. intercepting 
a Dell laptop that was sent out to European politicians. Right. And they changed the BIOS on it. Ah, uh, yeah. they were changing the BIOS to install um, some malware every time the computer loads it up and it, it detected that it wasn't on there. Yeah. The BIOS then reinstalled the malware. Right, yeah. So that's sim that's a, that's not the same, but very similar, where it's at a higher level than the operating system itself. So if you get into BIOS, um, then yeah, same thing. So stuff that happens before the kernel actually kicks in. So yeah, you can do all sorts of interesting stuff. So if you're faced with an attacker that's, that's doing that kind of stuff, it can be very, very difficult to detect that it's happened, and probably you won't notice that it's happened. Um, so keeping all this stuff in mind, if you've been compromised, you need to realize there might be some malware running even though you don't know, but you can't tell that there is, and there might be rootkits installed. Um, so you might uh, choose to look at analyzing processes, to look at the behavior of individual processes, um, and you can extract information from you know, the memory and stuff like that, but it can be very time consuming. Um, and it depends on what your role is. If you're doing malware analysis, you can get a lot of valuable information to find out exactly what a program is doing. But if you are working, maintaining the security of an organization, often you're not going to bother to go to that level of detail. Um, but it is still an important role that someone needs to do uh, as like a security researcher or you know working for antivirus software um, companies. Or if your company is really um, you know, you're working for a company that really wants to know exactly what happened, then you would start doing some malware analysis. Yeah, Chris? Um, if, when you're you compromised, would it be good practice to generally just assume that it's going to be the worst, really? The, the, the harshest thing that can ever I think you need to be aware what the worst case scenario is even though in a lot of cases it won't be this, right? That That's going to be quite rare. A virtualized rootkit is probably not going to happen. Kernel level or user space level is very, very possible. Um, but you can't always just assume the worst because what if that means taking an organization's server offline and losing the organization money? So it's all a matter of trade-offs and um, you know, if you have good reason to believe that you've been attacked, then you just want to make sure that you, you know what you're talking about and you actually do analyze it properly. And if you are in doubt, then you might be able to just switch it out for a clean slate, which is often a good option. If you've got a, a disk image that you can just revert to, make sure everything's up to date, and then, you know, it's not a bad idea every now and then just to, like, move to a fresh server. Um, but, you know, it's all it's all a matter of, you know, what's appropriate for the situation. So this, you know, it can be quite difficult for to detect rootkits. Um, we can do things like check for known Trojan um, programs and processes, so that's like integrity checking or like anti-malware, where we look at signatures of, of files. Um, we can look at consistency, which is really important. So if you've got a rootkit, often they'll miss something. So a rootkit might replace PS, um, but won't um, you know, rep, you know, change proc, for example, and you could look at those two and compare them to see whether or not PS is um, being tampered with. And you basically, you compare the output from different programs, and if there's something inconsistent, then there's, you know, reason to be like concerned. Uh, check kernel state, and you can use anti-malware scans. Obviously, is like a good idea in that situation. So. If you have been compromised, it might be safest, you know, Chris, it might, might be safest basically just to re-image re the entire system to a safe state, reinstall OS from scratch. Um, you know, you need to make sure you've got backups in place and hopefully you can do that in a very short amount of time. If you've just got a service running like Apache, you might have a config file for Apache and some files that go into a directory. You could literally do that in like a short amount of time. Like in, within an hour, you could get a new server up and running with the same files. Um, so, yeah, so there's a few things you could read. So, on the live system analysis topic, uh, I'll just conclude by saying you know, there's lots of information that you can find from a live system, but you do need to take have caution whenever you're looking at a system that's running. 
um, and different security goals for different organizations. Um, the question is, what are the risks and benefits of remaining offline in the face of possible compromise? So you're basically just deciding for you, whether the trade-offs are worth it. Because if you stay online, the attackers might actually be continuing to do bad things, right? All right. <laughs>